Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. This is Battles of the American Civil War with the Earls Bang and Dang, and we're just coming off of the kind of lackluster uh, second bowl run. That's garbage. Two parts of that. Not very, I mean, I know, we sound like, we want blood. <laughs> there was blood, but we're only a, three episodes away from the single bloodiest day in um, Civil War. Actually, uh, American history up until, uh, I think that was it. Either or, we got Richmond, the Battle of Richmond, not that Richmond, Richmond, Kentucky, Britain's Lane, Chantilly, which is directly uh, the day after, I think, or two days after uh, Bull Run, which directly uh, involves those same peoples, and Harper's Ferry, which uh, opens up to, what's his face, making his move into Maryland and finally invading the Union, so Union's on their heels right now. And McClellan and Pope are looking fucking stupid. And Lincoln has nobody he can turn to because apparently the whole general of the army, Henry Halleck, does nothing. Hmm. Sad. First up, Battle of Richmond, Kentucky, fall August 29th through the 30th. It hmm. was one of the most complete Confederate victories in the war Ooh. by Major General Edmund Kirby Smith against Union Major General William Bo Nelson, which were uh, his forces were defending the town. It's the first major battle in the Kentucky campaign that's going on at the same time as the Maryland campaign. The battle took place on and around what is now the grounds of the Bluegrass Army Depot outside of Richmond, Kentucky. Fantastic. Okay. Brigadier General Patrick Claiborne led Smith's advance with Colonel John S. Scott's cavalry up in the front. Okay. Confederate cavalry, while moving north from Big Hill on the road to Richmond on August 29th, encountered Union troopers and began skirmishing. Afternoon, Union artillery and infantry joined the fray, forcing the Confederate cavalry to retreat to Big Hill. Mm. At the time, Brigadier General Malon D. Manson who was commanding the Union forces in the area, commanded a brigade to march towards Rogerville, Kentucky, towards the rebels. Fighting for the day stopped and for pursuing Union forces briefly skirmished with Claiborne's men in the late afternoon. Afternoon. That night, Manson informed his superior, Bo Nelson, of his situation, and he ordered another brigade to be on the ready to march and support when required. Manson arrayed his four regiments to the south of Mount Zion Church and had them prepare. He said, we're going to attack! In the morning. Well, on the Confederate side, Smith ordered Claiborne to attack in the morning, promised to hurry reinforcements. Claiborne started early, marching north, passed through Kingston, dispersed Union skirmishers, approached Manson's battle line near Zion Church. As the day progressed, additional troops joined both sides. Following an artillery duel, the battle began. Manson reinforced the Union left flank, which he thought was weakening, but Churchill's troops... From the south, used a hidden ravine to come up on his right. Ooh. And after a concerted Confederate attack on the Union right, the Union troops gave away. Like, oh shit. They retreated into Rogersville, and which they made another futile stand at their old... Campground. <laughs> yeah, the old, the old campsite. By now, Smith and Nelson had arrived and taken command of their respected armies. Nelson rallied some troops in a cemetery outside Richmond. But they were routed. He's like, hey, man, might as well. Hurry, 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 hurry already. Nelson and some of his men escaped, but the Confederates captured over 4,300 Union troops. Dang. Total casualties were 5,353, 206 killed, 844 wounded, 4,303 captured or missing Dang. on the Union side. Dang. And a total of 451, 78 killed, 372 wounded, one missing for the Confederates. One missing? Wow. The way north towards Lexington and Frankfurt was open. Civil War historian Shelby Foote remarked that Smith accomplished in Kentucky the nearest thing to a cane, which was a battle in the Roman times, where uh, pretty much a complete tactical victory with no pushback ever scored by any general in the North or South in the mm. course of the whole war. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Well, the Civil War Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 365 acres of Richmond Battlefield, cool. the Mount Zion Christian Church, which served as a hospital during the battle, and has cannonballs embedded in its bricks walls. Yeah. Is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Two discontinuous areas totaling 214 acres were listed on the National Register of Historic Places as Battles of Richmond Historic Areas in 1996. These included four contributing buildings. And the uh, South continues to dominate, which yep. gives us the uh, Battle of Britain's Lane or Brighton's Lane on September 1st, 1862, which wasn't a battle at all. Near the village of Denmark in rural Madison County. Ooh, isn't there like a movie, Bridges of Madison County or something, right? Ordered to raid north from Mississippi by Major General Sterling Price on the uh, 
Confederate side, he was commanding the Army of West, thus to prevent Ulysses S. Grant's reinforcing Major General Don Carlos Buell in Tennessee, Brigadier General Frank C. Armstrong's Cavalry Brigade struck Colonel Elias S. Dennis's Federal Force of two cavalry troops, a battery, and two infantry. After four hours in which they suffered heavy losses while taking 213 prisoners and two field pieces, the Raiders withdrew their mission accomplished. Oh, Yep, good for them. Look at that. Well, was that even a battle, really? Well, well they... Yeah, that's 213 prisoners. They suffered heavy losses, apparently. Oh, heavy losses. Well, the Battle of Chantilly, or Ox Hill, the Confederate name, <laughs> took place on the 1st of September, 1862, Fairfax mm-hmm. County, Virginia, mm-hmm. as the concluding battle of the Northern Virginia Campaign of the Civil War. Stonewall Jackson's Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia attempted to cut off the line of retreat of the Union Army, of uh, the Union's Army of Virginia. I got the Battle of the Virginias. Uh-huh. Following the Second Battle of Manassas, but was attacked by two Union divisions. Hey, Stonewall, what are you getting attacked by? Defeated in the Second Battle of Bull Run on August 30th, Union Major General John Pope ordered his Army of Virginia to retreat to Centerville. Yes. The movement began after dark. Major General Irvin McDowell's Third Corps providing cover. The Army crossed Bull Run and the last troops across Major General Franz Siegel's First Corps. Destroyed the stone bridge behind them and said, you destroyed that damn bridge and you do it now. General E. Lee decided not to press the advantage gain that day, largely because he knew his Army of the North Virginia was exhausted from two weeks of nearly constant marching and nearly three days of battle. So the Union retreat went unmolested, unlike Joe Biden's daughter. Lee's decision also allowed the Army of Virginia's Second Corps under Major General Nathaniel P. Banks to consolidate with bulk of Pope's army marching in from Bristol Station, where they had been guarding the Army's trains. More importantly, Lee's decision bought time for the Union to push to the front. The Army of the Potomac's 2nd, 5th, and 6th Corps, which had been brought from the peninsula, and much to Major General George B. McClellan's dismay placed under Pope's command. Oh. By the morning of August 31st, Pope began to lose his grasp on command of his army. Uh-oh. The defeat at 2nd Bull Run seemed to have shattered his nerve, and Pope was unsure what to do next. He, yeah, watched he didn't even know. He was like, all this time I thought these guys were retreating... Right. And come to find out, I'm retreating. Well, he didn't know that Washington wanted an attack, but he feared Lee might strike first and destroy his reforming force before it was ready to fight again. Calling a conference of his corps commanders, something he had been loath to do previously in the Virginia campaign, uh, he agreed with their decision to retreat further into the Washington defenses. Mm. But a message from Henry Halleck directed him to attack, and he ordered an advance on Lee's <laughs> forces on the Manassas field. He's like, me think about that. No, bud. You, you get your ass out there. Continue to fight. General E. Lee, however, had already set in motion his own plan that would rob Pope of the initiative to attack. Lee directed Major General Stonewall Jackson to march his troops around Pope's right flank to get behind the Union position at Centerville. Leading the way and scouting for any Union blocking force was Confederate cavalry under the command of Jeb Stewart. General Longstreet's command would remain in place for the day to deceive Pope into believing that Lee's entire force remained in his front. While Jackson's Poor command, Longstreet, uh, all he does is serve as uh, decoys and right, man. While Jackson's command made its flanking march north and then east to take strategically important Germantown, Virginia, hmm. where Pope's only two routes to Washington, the Warren, the Warrington Pike, and the Little River Turnpike, converged. Oh, so that's an important part right there, right. Germantown, Virginia. They have no choice but to go through there. Damn so. right, Jackson's men hungry and worn. Move slowly, and they hunker down for the night at Pleasant Valley, three miles northeast of Centerville. As Pope settled down for the night on the 31st of August, he was unaware that Jackson was on the verge of turning his flank. Oh, jeez. During the night, two events occurred that forced Pope to change his mind. A staff oh. officer arrived from the Germantown position to report that a heavy force of cavalry had shelled the intersection before retreating. Pope initially dismissed the cavalry as little more than a patrol. Hmm. This guy's an idiot. When hours later, two Union cavalrymen reported seeing a large mass of infantry marching east down the Little River Turnpike, Pope realized that his army was in danger. Uh-oh. He countermanded actions, preparing for an attack, and directed the army to retreat from Centerville to Washington. Oh, shit. That's all he thinks about. Let's just go, guys. Right. He also sent out a series of infantry probes up the roads that Lee might use to reach his troops as they pulled back. Oh, shut up. <sighs> this guy's a dumbass. Morning of 1st September, Pope ordered Major General Edwin B. Sumner of the 2nd Corps, Army of the Potomac, to send a brigade north to reconnoiter. Go reconnoiter the brim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Army's cavalry was too exhausted for this mission, though. It sure was. 
But at the same time, he continued his movement in the direction of Washington, sending McDowell's Corps to Germantown, where it could protect the important intersection of Warrington Pike and Little River Turnpike, like we said, Oilia. He also sent two brigades from Major General Jesse L. Reno's 4th Corps mm, under the command of Brigadier Corps. General Isaac Stevens. Or 9th, but... Oh, yeah, sorry. Ninth Corps. Uh, under the command of Brigadier General Isaac Stevens to block Jackson. He's like, you go block that stone wall. Mm-hmm. Major General Philip Kearney's division from the 3rd Corps followed later that afternoon. Jackson resumed his march to the south, but his troops were tired and hungry and made poor progress as the rain continued. They marched only three miles and occupied Ox Hill. That's it. <laughs> southeast, of Chantilly Pl- Plan- uh, southeast of Chantilly Plantation and halted while Jackson himself took a nap. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. All during the morning, Confederate cavalry skirmished with Union infantry and cavalry. About 3 p.m., Stevens' division arrived at Ox Hill. Despite being outnumbered, he chose to attack across the grassy field against Brigadier General Alexander Lawton's division in the Confederate center. Uh-oh. Union attack was initially successful, routing the brigade of Colonel Henry Strong and driving in the flank of Captain William Brown with Brown killed during the fighting. Oh, shit. The Union division was driven back following a counterattack by Brigadier General Jubal Early's brigade, that Jubal Early. Stevens was killed during this oh. attack about 5 p.m. by a shot through his temple. Oh. <sighs> a severe thunderstorm erupted about at this I am. He got shot in the head and it started raining. Mm, right. Resulted in. Kill a spider. <laughs> don't result- kill a. No. Don't kill a. Uh, don't kill a Stevens, it'll rain. Right. <laughs> Resulting in limited visibility and increased dependence on the bayonet. As the rain soaked the ammo of the infantry and made it useless. Yep. Kearney arrived about this time with his division to find Stevens' units disorganized. He's like, mm. where's Stevens? You don't want to know, boss. Right. He's face down in that mud puddle over there. <laughs> Perceiving a gap in the line, he deployed Brigadier General David B. Burney's brigade on Stevens' left, ordering it to attack across the field. Burney managed to maneuver close to the Confederate line, but his attack stalled in hand-to-hand combat with A.P. Hill's division. Kearney mistakenly rode into the Confederate lines during the battle and was moited. Oh, no. As Kearney's other two brigades arrived on the field, Burney used the reinforcements as a rear guard as he withdrew the remainder of the Union forces to the southern side of the farm fields. Thus... Ending the battle. Kearney. What an idiot. He did all that shit previously just to ride into the wrong side of the line. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, shit. Hey, hey, come on. Hey, come, on. God, come on, guys. There's got to be some sort of like a... Well, they probably just shot him. Probably didn't know he was until he was dead. There was some sort of a, like a ceasefire with generals and stuff, right? You're probably allowed to... Probably just shot him. Didn't know who he was. <laughs> crazy. Flipping crazy. I mean, this... You got generals riding into the enemy. You had... <laughs> He had uh, Stonewall basically walking with the Union troops for, what, a little he, while? He did that on purpose, though. <laughs> Sounded like that was on accident. Right. <laughs> that night, Longstreet arrived to relieve Jackson's troops and to renew the battle in the morning. The lines were so close that some soldiers accidentally stumbled in the camps of the opposing army. Nobody died there, though, huh? No. Poor Kearney. The Union army withdrew to the Germantown and Fairfax Courthouse that night, followed over the next few days by retreating to the defenses of Washington. Confederate cavalry attempted a pursuit, but failed to cause significant damage to the army. Okay. The fighting was tactically inconclusive. Although Jackson's turn and movement was foiled, and he was unable to block the Union retreat or destroy Pope's, Pope's, <laughs> Pope's army, National Park Service historians count Chantilly as a strategic Confederate victory because it neutralized any threat from Pope's army and cleared the way for Lee to begin his Maryland campaign. Right. He said, we're going into Maryland, boys. Well, the Confederates claimed a tactical victory as well because they held the field after the battle. That's true. I would say that's a tactical victory. Two Union generals were moited, mm. while one Confederate brigade commander was killed. Pope, recognizing the attack as an indication of continued danger to his army, continued his retreat to the fortifications around Washington, D.C. General Lee began the Maryland campaign, culminated in the Battle of Antietam after Pope retreated from Virginia. The Army of the Potomac, under Major General George B. McClellan, absorbed the forces of Pope's Army of Virginia, which was disbanded as a separate army because Pope was adios, amigos. Yep. Site of the battle. Once rural farmland is now surrounded by sur- suburban development in Fairfax County. Oh, wow. The modern thoroughfares of U.S. Route 50, which is Lee Jackson Memorial Highway. Wow. Huh. And State Route 286, as well as State Route 608, intersect near the location of the battle. 4.8 acre Memorial Park, the Ox Hill Battlefield Park, is located off the West Ox Road. Yeah, okay. Uh, the shopping center there includes most of the General Isaac Stevens portion of the battle, about 1.5% of the total ground. It's under jurisdiction of the Fairfax County Park Authority. 
Against, they're going to read. They're going to develop it more. A small yard located within the nearby Fairfax Town Center has been preserved to mark the area crossed by Confederate troops to get to the Ox Hill Battlefield. Good for them. Mm-hmm. Mm. The Battle of Harper's Ferry. Last one today, but this is a four-day battle here, guys. Fought September 12th to 15th as part of the Maryland campaign. Yep, first day. The uh, Union is officially entered. <laughs> it was officially penetrated. <laughs> Harper's Ferry is a small town to the confluence of the Potomac River and the Shenandoah River. Site of a historic federal arsenal founded by George Washington in, 19, hey. in 1799. Hey. And a bridge for the critical Baltimore and Ohio Railroad across the Potomac. Okay. Fantastic. 1859 was the site of the abolitionist John Brown's attack on the federal arsenal. Right. At the time, the garrison at Harper's Ferry, officially the Railroad Brigade of the Middle Department, 8th Army Corps, the purpose of which was to protect the strategically vital Baltimore, Ohio Railroad and Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, where they passed through the area, as well as the lower Shenandoah Valley. Oh, my. <laughs> and which was the last remaining sizable Union force south of the Potomac, consisting of about 10,400 men, later joined by 2,500 from the Union garrison at Martinsburg, plus a large cache of smaller arms, as well as artillery pieces, wagons, and Union uniforms. Well, good for them. The town was virtually indefensible as it was dominated on all sides by higher ground. You can't have that. Yeah. To the west, the ground rose gradually for about a high, mile and a half to Bolivar Heights, a plateau 669 feet high that stretches from the Potomac to the Shenandoah, further west and parallel with Schoolhouse Ridge. To the south, across the Shenandoah, Loudon Heights overlooks from 1,180 feet. And to the northeast, across from the Potomac, the southernmost extremity extremity of Elk Ridge forms a 1,476-foot high crest of the Maryland Heights. Wow. Mm. Federal soldier wrote that if these three heights could not be held, Harper's Ferry would be no more defensible than a whale bottom. General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, ANV, advanced into Maryland. Lee expected that the Union garrisons that blocked his supply line would be cut off and abandoned without firing a shot. But the garrisons, Harper's Ferry specifically, were still manned. No. Lee planned to capture the garrison to secure his lines of communication and potential retreat back to Virginia. Potential. Yeah, he's like, we have to go. This is All our right. only way. we got to get uh, some cleared. All right. Although he was being pursued at a measured pace by Major General George McClellan and the Union Army of the Potomac, which outnumbered him by more than two to one, wow. General Lee chose the risky strategy of dividing his army in order to seize Harper's Ferry. He was smart. He needed to. While the rest of the Virginia remained at Boonesboro, Boonesboro, Maryland. He's hunkering down in the north, huh? He's like, this is nice up here, guys. <laughs> You just smell the smokes coming out of the stacks at the industries. Right. At the industries. <laughs> <laughs> Lee sent three columns of troops to converge and attack Harper's Ferry from separate directions. The largest column, 11,500 men under Jackson, was to recross the Potomac and circle around to the west of Harper's Ferry and attack it from Bolivar Heights, while the other two columns under Major General Lafayette McLaws, who had 8,000 men, and Brigadier General John G. Walker, who had 3,400 men. They were to capture Maryland Heights and Loudoun Heights, respectively, commanding the town from the east and the south. Hmm. Well, McClellan had wanted to add the Harper's Ferry garrison to his field army, but General Chief Henry Halleck had refused. He said that the movement would be too difficult and the garrison had to defend itself until the latest moment or until McClellan could relieve it. Right. Halleck had probably expected his commander, Colonel Dixon Miles, to show some military knowledge and courage. Well, unfortunately hit for him, Miles was a 38-year-old veteran of the U.S. Army and Mexican-American War, but who had been disgraced after the first Battle of Bull Run when oh, a no. corps of inquiry held that he had been drunk during the battle. Oh. Miles swore off liquor and was sent to the supposedly quiet post at Harper's Ferry. Well, not no more. I doubt he swore a blagger, but what do you All right. His garrison comprised of 14,000 men, many inexperienced, including 2,500 who had been forced out of Martinsburg by the approach of Jackson's men on only September the 11th. Oh, these guys are already scared of Jackson. <laughs> yep. Jeez. It was September 11th, 1862. McLaws arrived at Brownsville, six miles northeast of Harper's Ferry. He left 3,000 men near Brownsville Gap to protect his rear and moved 3,000 others toward the Potomac River to seal off any eastern escape route from Harper's Ferry. He dispatched the veteran brigades of Brigadier General Joseph B. Kershaw and William Barksdale to seize Maryland Heights on September 12th. The other Confederate columns were making slow progress and were behind schedule. Well, of course they are. Well, they always are, right? Stone, Stonewall's men were delayed at <laughs> No, Marksdale. you don't say. Walker's men were ordered to destroy the aqueduct carrying the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal across the Monarchy 
the Monocacy River. Is it Monocacy or Monocacy? Whatever. Where it empties into the Potomac. But his engineers had difficulty demolishing the stone structure, and the attempt was eventually abandoned. Oh, yeah, let's get that here. Uh, Walker re-entered Virginia in Loudoun County on mm-hmm. September 9th across from the is it Loudoun uh, racetrack in Virginia or something, right? Uh, which was across from New Point Hampshire. of Rock. So Walker was escorted by Colonel E.V. White, a Loudoun native, and his 35th Battalion of Virginia Cavalry. White was unhappy with the assignment and preferred to be with the rest of the Army. Unfortunately, White had gotten into an altercation with uh, General Jeb Stewart and Uh-oh. Frederick and was subsequently ordered back to Virginia by Lee. Oh, man, we got some uh, turmoil yeah. and no uh, ribs. Well, whether or not his disposition was to blame, White led Walker on a meandering route around the Short Hill Mountain to reach the base of Loudoun Heights four days later on September 13th. Oh, my. So the attack on Harper's Ferry that had been planned for the 11th was delayed and increased the risk that McClellan might engage and destroy a portion of Lee's army while it was divided. Right, what a oh, dick. It almost cost him everything. What a dick. Miles divided his 10,400 garrison troops into four brigade. That's from the north. Making sure that the raw, inexperienced men he had recently received were balanced by more experienced soldiers. Well, it's pretty obvious with that one. He positioned two brigades, about 7,000 men, on Bolivar Heights in a line that stretched from the Potomac River to the Shenandoah. On nearby Camp Hill, he placed another 1,000-man brigade of heavy artillery and supporting infantry to cover the position on Bolivar Heights. Miles did not position men on Loudoun Heights, considering it, it the least important of the heights, as he deemed it too difficult for Confederate artillery to be placed there. In any event, any rebel force there could be attacked by the artillery on Maryland Heights. Right. Miles did not believe that the rebels could come by that route and would instead approach via Bolivar Heights like they're coming from. Well, he doesn't know that there's more than one. <laughs> right. The defenses of the most important position, which was Maryland Heights, were designed to fight off raiders but not to hold their heights themselves. Mm. There was a powerful artillery batter, battery halfway up the heights, two 9-inch naval Dahlgren rifles, one 50-pounder Parrot, and four 12-pounder smoothbores that could protect the Camp Hill and Bolivar Heights positions. On the crest, Miles assigned Colonel Thomas H. Four of the uh, Ford of the 32nd Ohio Infantry to command parts of four regiments, 1,600 men total. Some of these men, including those of the 126th New York, had been in the Army only 21 days and lacked basic combat skills. They had only just arrived at Harper's Ferry. Oh, well, I mean, that's what happens. They erected a primitive breastwork and sent skirmishers a quarter mile in the direction of the Confederates. September 12th, they encountered the approaching men from the Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade, who had been moving slowly through the very difficult terrain on Elk Ridge. Mm. Yeah, anytime you go on a ridge, <laughs> rifle volleys from behind the abatis caused the Confederates to stop for the night. They're like, we don't think so. <sighs> well, 13th September, Kershaw began his attack at about 6.30 a.m., he planned to push his own brigade directly against the Union breastworks, while Barksdale's Mississippians flanked Federal right. Kershaw's men charged into the Betas twice and were driven back with heavy losses. The inexperienced New York troops were holding their own. Look at them. Their commander, Colonel Ford, fell ill that morning and stayed back to be called in sick. <laughs> Leaving the fighting to Colonel El- Elikim Sherrill, the second-ranking officer. Sherrill was wounded by a miniball. Through the cheek a ah, and tongue while railing his men. He had to be carried off the field, making the green troops grow panicky. As Barksdale's Mississippians approached on the flank, the New Yorkers broke and fled rearward. Although Major General Sylvester Hewitt ordered the remaining units to reform farther along the ridge, orders came at 3.30 p.m. Orders came from 3.30 p.m. from Colonel Ford to retreat. In doing so, he apparently neglected to send for the 900 men of the 115th New York waiting in reserve midway up the slope. <laughs> They're like, what the hell, man? <laughs> His men destroyed their artillery pieces and crossed the pontoon bridge back to Harper's Ferry. All right. Well, Ford later insisted he had the authority for Miles to order the withdrawal, but a court of inquiry concluded, concluded that he had abandoned his position without sufficient cause right. and recommended his dismissal from the Army. Damn right. During the fight in on Maryland Heights, the other Confederate columns arrived. Walker to the base of the Loudoun Heights at 10 a.m. and Jackson's three divisions to the west of Bolivar Heights at 11, and were astonished to see that their positions were not defended. Oh, wow. They're like, look at that shit. Inside the town, the Union officers realized they were surrounded and pleaded with Miles to attempt to recapture Maryland Heights, but he refused, insisting that uh, the force the force on Bolivar Heights would protect the town. Uh, he exclaimed, I am ordered to hold this place, and gosh damn my soul to hell if I don't. Oh. In fact, Jackson and Miles' forces to the west of town were roughly equal but Miles was ignoring the threat from the artillery mass into his northeast and south. Oh, no. We can't do that. What is up with these guys? What are this union? All the good guys went to the south. It's dumb. <laughs> right. 
Later that night, Miles sent Captain Charles Russell of the 1st Maryland Cavalry with nine troopers to slip through the enemy lines and take a message to McClellan, or any other general they could find, informing them that the besieged town could hold only for about 24 hours. Or 48, you right, know. 48 hours. <laughs> Why would he say that? We can only hold 48 hours, but it's probably what they have left for ammunition and stuff. Why? Oh, you have to get the McClellan. Right. Otherwise, he would be forced to surrender. Ooh. Russell's men slipped across South Mountain and reached McClellan's headquarters at Frederick. General was surprised and dismayed when he received the news. He's like, what? I'm very surprised. <laughs> Frankly, I'm dismayed. dismayed. <laughs> he wrote a message to Miles that a relief force was on the way and told him, hold out to the last extremity. If it is possible, reoccupy the Marion Heights with your whole force. See? Oh, look at that. McClellan ordered Major General William B. Franklin and his 6th Corps, 5th, 6th Corps, to march from Crampton's Gap to relieve Miles. Although three couriers were sent with this information on different routes, none of them reached Harper's Ferry in time. Well, while battles raged at the passes of, on South Mountain, Jackson had methodically positioned his artillery around Harper's Ferry. Oh. This included four parrot rifles to the summit of Maryland Heights. Tasks that required 200 men wrestling the ropes of each gun. Jeez. Dang. Although Jackson wanted all of his guns to open fire simultaneously, Walker on Loudon Heights grew impatient and began an ineffectual bombardment with five guns shortly after 1 p.m. <laughs> Jackson ordered A.P. Hill to move down the west bank of the Shenandoah in pre- pre- preparation for a flank attack on the Federal left the next morning. The fucking Walker guy's right. moron. That night, Union officers realized they had less than 24 hours left, but they made no attempt to recapture Maryland Heights. No oh, man. Unbeknownst to Miles, only a single Confederate regiment now occupied that crest after McLaws had withdrawn to the remainder, or had withdrawn his remainder to meet the Union assault at Crampton's Gap. Mm. So there's nobody up there. Easily could have taken it, but right. again, we have another idiot Union Jeez. general. I mean, Colonel Benjamin Davis, they call him Grimes, proposed to Miles that his troopers of the 8th New York Cavalry the Loudoun Rangers, the 12th Illinois Cavalry, and some smaller units from Maryland and Rhode Island that they could break out. Cavalry force was essentially useless in the defense of the town. Miles dismissed the idea as wild and impractical. <laughs> but Davis was adamant and Miles relented when he saw that the fiery Mississippian intended to break out. He's like, yeah, they're about to fuck us up. You guys can go. <laughs> with or without permission. Oh, yeah, with or without permission. Davis and Colonel Arno Voss led their 1,400 cavalrymen out of Harper's Perry on a pontoon bridge across the Potomac, turning left onto a narrow road that wound to the west around the base of the Maryland Heights in the north toward Sharpsburg. Despite a number of close calls with turning Confederates from South Mountain, the cavalry column encountered a wagon train approaching from Hagerstown with James Longstreet's reserve supply of ammo. Oh, They were able to trick the wagoneers into following them in another direction and repulsed the Confederate cavalry escort in the rear of the calm. And the southern Teamsters found themselves surrounded by Federals in the morning. Capturing more than 40 enemy ordnance wagons, Davis had lost not a single man in the combat. The first great cavalry exploit of the war for the Army of the Potomac. Oh, good for them. Finally, September 15th, last day of the battle at dawn, McClaws' repositioning of his Confederate troops, 8,000 men in two lines, across the floor of the Pleasant Valley, was revealed to Franklin, who had been tasked by McClellan to cut off, destroy, or capture McClaw's command and relieve Colonel Miles. Oh, okay. It was a bluff by McClaw's, and it worked because Franklin was convinced that he was outnumbered two to one and that it would be suicidal to attack Uh-oh. the Confederate formation. The deluded Franklin thus halted only six miles from Harper's Ferry. There would be no relief for Miles' garrison. Oh. By the morning of September 15th, Jackson had positioned nearly 50 guns on Maryland Heights and at the base <laughs> of Loudoun Heights, prepared to infilade the rear of the Federal line at Boulevard Heights. Damn right. Jackson began a fierce artillery barrage from all sides and ordered an infantry assault for 8 a.m. Well, Miles then realized the situation was hopeless. Mm. He had no expectation that uh, re- relief would arrive in time, and his artillery ammunition was in short supply. Yeah, got to go. He's like, yeah, I should have uh, taken Maryland Heights at yeah. least. Yeah, at a council of war with his brigade commanders, he agreed to raise the white flag of surrender. But he would not be personally present at any ceremony. <laughs> He's like, you guys go do that. I'll be- yeah. He was confronted by he was confronted by a captain of the 126 New York Infantry who said, "For fuck's sake, Colonel, don't surrender us! Don't you hear the signal guns? Our forces are near us. Let us cut our way out and join them." Mm-hmm. But Miles replied, "Impossible! <laughs> <laughs> they will blow us out of this place in half an hour." As the captain turned away in disdain, a shell exploded, shattering Miles's left leg. Mm-hmm. Oh shit! He was lying. Right. 
Jeez, so disgusted were the men of the garrison with Miles' behavior, with some claim involved being drunk again. Uh-huh. It was difficult to find a man who would take him into the hospital. Oh, jeez. He was mortally wounded and died the next day. Wow. Some historians have speculated that Miles was struck deliberately by fire from his own men. <laughs> with Miles incapacitated, the formal surrender of the garrison to Jackson was undertaken by Brigadier General Julius White, a political general who had commanded the Union forces from Martinsburg Garrison, and who had come to Harpers Ferry with his troops, but, although senior to Miles, had not taken command of the garrison there, deferring it to instead the commander on the scene. Why Why would you not? It's just a political general, which means right. nothing. Right. Jackson had achieved victory at a minor expense. The Confederate Army sustained 286 casualties for 39 killed, 247 wounded, mostly from the fight on Maryland Heights, while the Union sustained 12,636 which was only 44 killed, 173 wounded, but 12,419 captured. Damn. This is what I saw about. It was the largest surrender of federal forces during the Civil War and the largest number of United States troops to surrender until the fall of Bataan and the Philippines during World War II. Jeez. Union Garrison also surrendered 13,000 small arms, 200 wagons, 73 artillery pieces. The list of captured artillery pieces include one 50-pounder Parrot, which was spiked, six M1841 24-pounder howitzers, four 20-pounder parrot rifles, eight M1841 12-pounder field gun, two spiked, four 12-pounder Napoleons, two of which were spiked, six six 6-pounder field guns, two 10-pounder dogger guns, which were all spiked, ten 3-inch ordnance rifles, and six 3-inch James's rifles. Okay. Confederate soldiers feasted on Union food supplies and helped themselves to fresh blue federal uniforms, oh, which shit. would cause some confusion in the coming days. Oh, it would. About the only unhappy men in Jackson's force were the cavalry men, who had hoped to replenish their exhausted mounts, but were not able to because of Colonel Grimes' Davis breakout. Yeah, he took all the horses. He's like, bye. Yeah, what are you going to do? Well, then Jackson sent off a courier to Lee with the news. He said, through God's blessing, Harper's Ferry and its garrison are to be surrendered. As he rode into town to supervise his men, Union prisoners lined the roadside, eager for a look at the famous Stonewall Jackson. One of them observed Jackson's dirty, seedy uniform remark. Boys, he isn't much for looks, but if we had him, we wouldn't have been caught in this trap. Ooh, he's like, you're damn right. <laughs> By early afternoon, Jackson received an urgent message from General Lee, telling him to get his troops to Sharpsburg as quickly as possible. Jackson left A.P. Hill at Harper's Ferry to manage the parole of federal prisoners and began marching to join the Battle of Antietam. It's Antietam. Antietam. <laughs> <laughs> the War Department appointed a special commission under Major General David Hunter to determine the reasons for the loss at Harper's Ferry. Well, uh, outnumbered. <laughs> you guys suck. Right. During 15 days of testimony resulted in over 900 pages of evidence the commission focused on Miles' incompetence and loyalty. I mean, does it really matter? Right. The guy's dead. <laughs> His defense of the garrison, the action of the subordinate officers, and missed opportunities for escape and rescue. Right. The commission found that a primary cause of the defeat lie in the actions of Colonel Thomas Ford oh. in his defense of Maryland Heights, which it found to be without ability. Yep. Ford's abandonment of his post was seen to be without sufficient cause, and his general military capacity Military capacity was determined to be uh, of nature as to disqualify him from further military command. General John E. Wool, who as commander of the Middle Department in Baltimore, was Miles' superior until he was placed under McClellan's orders and who had ordered Miles to defend at all hazards the indefensible position. He received censure for putting Miles in command at Harper's Ferry. Good for him. General McClellan also came in for criticism for failing to relieve and protect the garrison. Oh, just criticism, though. Right. Finally, although Colonel Miles was dead and the commission expressed some reluctance to criticize an officer who could not speak in his own behalf. He was nevertheless described as having incapacity amounting to almost imbecility wow. for the shameful surrender of this important post. He's an imbecile. Hmm. The commission opined that if McClellan's forces had been faster to reach Harper's Ferry, or if Miles had managed to hold on without surrendering so quickly, the enemy would have been forced to raise the siege or have been taken into detail. Hmm. General Henry Halleck, who, as general-in-chief, had refused McClellan's request to attack, attach the Harper's Ferry garrison to the Army of Potomac, thus denying him an additional 11,000 troops and leaving Miles in an untenable situation, was not mentioned whatsoever in the commission's criticism. Of course. Hmm. Civil War Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 542 acres of the battlefield and nine acquisitions since 2002, much of which has been incorporated into the Harper's Ferry National Historic Park 
which also preserves portions of the benefit. I would hope so. Right. Additional areas preserved within Harper's Ferry Historic District and the National Register of Historic Places listed BNO Railroad Potomac River Crossing. Good for them. And as usual, another ignorant uh, generals from the Union doing some <laughs> stupid shit. I mean, holy I mean, fuck, dude. Is it Jackson that is like just screwing everybody's minds up? I guess. He's like Pete. I mean, it's just pathetic. He's like, it's Stonewall over there. What are we? What, oh, no matter if we have 10 times the men, he's going to murder us all. We must retreat. Everybody's so afraid to do anything. It's sad. Nobody wants to listen to intelligence. Nope. Nobody wants to listen to, like, hey, uh, Pope, we got people marching up on our right flank. No, we don't. Nah. <laughs> Oh, wait. I see them. <laughs> it's too late for us now, Talking fellas. About those guys? <laughs> Shit. Oh, jeez. Next up, we got the Battle of Charleston in Virginia, Munfordville, and South Mountain, which is um, going on actually at the same time uh, as all these battles are going on at the same time as the Harper's Ferry, because that was five days, and all these are taking place within that five days. So uh, lots of stuff going on at the same time, dude. We'll have those, plus the week after next, the big, the big one, the Ooh. bigger one, the Battle of Antietam, which is the where the uh, uh, Maryland campaign ends, and it's only been a couple of weeks. Right. Combined total of 22,717 dead, wounded, or missing wow. in that one. Um, yeah, bloodiest day of battle in the history of the Civil War here. Crazy. Everybody would think Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, or... Well, would be. Fredericksburg was deadly or as a battle but not in one day right so we have that all coming up here in the meantime you go check out battles of america oh wow you're already checking this out you can go check out outlaws and gunslingers where we'll be this week's episode all about virginia tech mass shooting crazy one dude went on two separate shootings within hours well did one early in the morning and then Nothing happened to him. He came back a couple hours later and massacred a bunch of more people. So, yeah, good stuff going on there. All because of a girl. Well, kind of. All because he was a weirdo stabbing carpets with a knife at parties and shit like that. Weird guy. But uh, that, and then we got this week in sports history. is covering all the important, not so important, um, everything else in between facts and history moments of the week there. <clears throat> if you want to get this episode ad-free, which you've probably heard about 10 ads so far in this episode you can go to patreon.com forward slash bang dang all those shows i just talked about their audio ad free no ads so two dollars a month you can get all that or you can listen to the ads here whatever either way we're making money <laughs> i mean there you go uh yeah we'll be back next week for charleston munfordville and south mountain we are the mush- <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> we are the mushmouth michiganders yes we're the mouth of michiganders bang dang <laughs>